Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. It's a moot point whether President Macron or President Trump will tumble into the 20% of public approval first. The French Tony Blair hit the barn door of defeating Marine Le Pen easily enough after both the French Conservative Party and the French Labour Party failed to make the final runoff. But it's been 100 days since. He was the main man who came from nowhere and who created a party out of nothing. Rien. Is he the future, not just for France, but for all of us? The collapse into centrism, or as some might put it, into the void? Who better to help us with that than Dr. Russell Foster of King's College London, our man for all things European. Welcome back, Dr. Russell. Uh, Macron, 36% in the polls and falling. Is he... A dead duck, uh, or is this something that must be expected this early? Well, to understand Macron's slide in the polls, I think it's first of all important to understand the context in which Macron emerged. As you pointed out, the collapse of the two mainstream parties, which was similar to what we saw in the Italian referendum in December and the Dutch election earlier this year. Macron emerged as a centrist candidate who was able to create an image of appealing across the political spectrum very similar to Marine Le Pen. Now, because Macron came from such a young party with no experience, it seemed inevitable that sooner or later his honeymoon period with the French electorate would end. And as we've seen in the last six weeks, his approval ratings have taken quite a plummet of dropping 10 to 12 points in the space of just over a month. Now, a significant cause of this is that Macron, in my opinion, did not win because he was the choice of the French people. He won because he was the lesser of two evils running against the Front National. You'll recall that during the campaign, the supporters of Jean-Luc Mélenchon and Benoit Hamond were chanting a, little sleep, uh, a slogan that was little seen in the British press that was, ni banquier, ni raciste. We want neither a banker nor a racist. And so for many of the French electorate, Macron was a, a preferable choice to the Front National. Now that he's quite uh, brutally defeated the Front National in the presidential elections and the National Assembly elections, his honeymoon period does seem to be coming to an end. However, he has accomplished quite a lot in that time, which can give us some indication of the sort of presidency that Macron is going to operate for the next few years. Tell me first, though, I expected him to win the presidency uh, in the brutal way that he, he did. I didn't expect him to win the parliamentary elections as convincing. After all, he was actually leading a party that, prior to that, had not even existed. This is a, a something that none of us expected. So the only precedent we had for a presidential runoff between the Front National and another party was the 2002 election in which Jacques Chirac wiped the floor with Jean-Marie Le Pen. So it seems that the very toxicity of Front National meant that Macron was going to win by default. But, like you, I thought that by the time of the National Assembly elections, we would see the Front National making quite significant inroads, along with the supporters of <coughs> Hamon Socialists and Mélenchon. What is surprising is that En Marche, which, as you pointed out, came out of nowhere, has won quite a staggering victory mm. in the National Assembly. Now, I think a lot of this is to do with France's dissatisfaction at a string of governments and presidents who have, who have appeared less and less capable of uniting the various factions of France. We saw that Sarkozy was charming and charismatic, but uh, mired in sleaze. Mm -hmm. We saw that uh, François Hollande was well-meaning, but quite weak, and ended up with the lowest approval ratings uh, in the Fifth Republic's history. So a large part of, his, of Macron's National Assembly victory is due to the French people wanting a stable 
president and a stable National Assembly which can pass the legislation which France so badly needs. Also, a lot of this has to do with the manner in which Macron is running his own party. More and more he is appearing as quite a monarchical leader of En Marche. The 478 candidates that he put forward for En Marche in the parliamentary elections were handpicked by him rather than in internal elections like the other parties. So he's been able to manoeuvre the right people into the right seats. And let's not forget that Macron, as much as he's new to politics, he has demonstrated in the campaign and in the last hundred days that he is very, very clever at playing the French political system. Hand-picking candidates, not standing for much. Sounds a bit Tony Blair exactly. to me. Exactly. <clears throat> this is why I think his approval is starting to slip a little bit. He appeared as France's saviour, as Europe's saviour, at a moment when it seemed that French politics were a choice between uh, the failed establishment and what used to be a hard right party but has now just become a generic anti-foreigner party. So he was able to appeal to people who wanted something stable, something mainstream. But as you point out, the fact that he's appealing quite broadly means that he's not actually satisfying mm. much mm. of the electorate. A mile wide, uh, a centimeter deep. Precisely. So some of his strategies that we saw in the early days of his presidency, such as reaching out to the other parties in order to appoint top cabinet positions, these were politically very, very intelligent moves in order to try and unite the disparate factions of France. However, what he cannot get past is the fact that in the first round of the French elections, three quarters of the French electorate voted against him yeah. because they didn't want him. And now with Marine Le Pen thrown under the bus by her own party and no real opposition leaders to Macron, he is now becoming a figurehead, a symbolic figure for the French people to invest their continuing dissatisfaction in. Well, the, the, the big surprise for me, if you think about that presidential vote, Mélenchon got 20%, so if he'd got just a few percent more, it would have been him up against Marine Le Pen. It would have been Tony Benn plus versus Marine Le Pen. That would have been an election worth going across to work in. Uh, but he did very poorly in the parliamentary elections. It seems as if he was a figure, but the people didn't fancy his party much. There could be a connection here between what we've seen in the United Kingdom over Brexit and what we saw in the Netherlands over their election, that in the early stages this was politically highly polarised with people demonising the other side. But now that a decision has been made, uh, we may be seeing in France the same as we saw in Britain with the adamant Remainers accepting the decision, in the Netherlands with the adamant Geert Wilders supporters now giving their tacit support to a government which is still a caretaker yeah, government, they haven't formed one yet. Mm. So it could simply be this case that, they, that the Hamon de Mélenchon supporters acknowledge that they've lost and it makes more sense to get behind a moderate centrist like Macron rather than to continue making difficulties because making difficulties in the National Assembly is going to benefit one group alone and that's the Front National. Mm. Because they are very much a minority now, yeah. like Wilder's party, yeah. like the hardcore of UKIP which still exists, they are now in the very advantageous position that they can sit back and snipe at every one of Macron's intended reforms and policies without themselves having to take any blame. So that's what they're, they're doing, they're not exactly, taking any exactly. proactive... So Macron's success in the parliamentary elections could turn out to be a hindrance for him further down the line, mm. in that there will be a vocal minority in the National Assembly. Well, yeah, the, the buck stops with him, exactly. clearly. And they can just sit back and say, essentially, we told you so. What's happened to the Front National? It's imploded, essentially. Because Marine Le Pen made this such a personal party, it was focused very much around the figure of the leader, around Marine Le Pen. She is now discredited because she failed to, uh, to get through in the second round of the elections. And so her niece has essentially pushed her out of the party. So the Front National is a little bit uh, like wow. UKIP at the moment. Well, it's a bit like the Borgias. Yeah. She turned on her own father exactly. and now her niece, niece. has turned on... Her. We see this a lot in French politics, this dynastic <laughs> politics. Yeah. It's well, it's dynastic, it's almost Miliband-ish. 
uh, uh, never mind the Borgias. And it's um, quite ironic that uh, Macron's uh, university thesis as a student was on Machiavelli, so well, he seems to know quite well how to well, play factions well, well, against each uh, other. Now tell us, uh, in closing, what are the main things that Macron has done in his first hundred days, and what's he likely to do next? Well, he's had successes and failures. So his successes have been reaching out to other parties in order to unite them into a coalition of the willing. He has had some defeat, well, not defeats, but difficult moments. The most emphatic one was the resignation of General de Villiers as uh, the chief of staff of the French military because of Macron's proposals for uh, a 650 million euro reduction to the military budget. And we're also seeing a difficult foreign relations emerging between Macron, Trump, and next month we're going to see difficulties with him in Germany. Macron's big test is going to be in the next three months. Over the summer, it's generally quiet in Western European politics. Next month, we're going to see the beginning of the protests and the inevitable riots against his proposed labour reforms, which will make it easier to hire people, but make it easier to fire people as well. So we're going to see a lot of protests against that, and we're going to see Macron dealing with whatever has been the outcome of the German election to see whether his intended proposals for European reform are going to be carried through on a Franco-German coalition or whether they're going to fall at the first hurdle. So not necessarily rose petals in front of him. Uh, could be a, a long, hot winter, actually, of Labour discontent and nobody does labour discontent like the French. The French have a rare gift for demonstrating public <laughs> dissatisfaction. And in a country they know with... They how to demonstrate, yes. Exactly. In a country with rising unemployment, with difficult uh, domestic political situations, Macron is going to be facing some very difficult times ahead. Just as well they've got rid of all those cobblestones in the uh, <laughs> streets of Paris. Your students are lucky to have you, Dr. Well, thank Russell you. Foster. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Sputnik. Thank you. After a break, as the U.S. begins to fall apart at the racial seams, what is next on the front line between Russia and the USA? Stay tuned. Welcome back to Sputnik. At the time of making this recording, Donald Trump is still president of the United States, but he may not be much longer. As his deep state enemies swarm around him, Donald Trump made a potentially fatal error over Charlottesville. It may have achieved a critical mass of disapproval. Does this internal crisis make the U.S. less dangerous to the rest of the world or more dangerous? Joining us to discuss it is Dr. Tomas Pirschenek, a writer on RT's Op Edge and editor of the London Progressive Journal, and also a junior hospital doctor who's just come off shift after just a couple of hours sleep, but you won't be able to tell. Doctor, thanks for squeezing us into your extremely busy professional life. Uh, many people think that the complete mayhem in Washington, yeah. where nobody seems to stay in their job for more than five minutes, <laughs> where the president sometimes appears to be ready to fire himself, or at least acts as if he wants to be fired, uh, and everyone's stabbing each other in the back. The party system has collapsed. Many people think that's good because they won't be able to pay much attention to the rest of us. But that's not necessarily true, is it? Um, you're right, George, and thank you for having me on the show. Pleasure to be here. Um, you're absolutely right. The US is an empire in decline. It's in slow decline, but nevertheless, it is in decline. And actually, like a, like a cornered animal, it's at its most dangerous when it's cornered. And... I mean, the U.S. is going down, but the problem is it might take some or all of the world with it. Well, that, I mean, you make that almost as a quip, but it's true mm. over North Korea. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if Donald Trump, like Dr. Strangelove, climbs astride a nuclear bomb and wearing a cowboy hat descends, shouting, wee-ha, <laughs> on his way into Pyongyang, Russia and China will, will respond in, uh, in a nuclear way, they're bound to. If you fire a nuclear weapon at their next door neighbor, uh, there's only one way that that can end. And it's not actually all that fantastical, is it? No, I mean, absolutely not. And it's not just Russia and China that border North Korea, uh, South Korea, Seoul, the, uh, which is a US ally, and it's also pushing for war with North Korea, 
they would also be obliterated. The Seoul, the capital of South Korea, is only about 100 miles from the, uh, the yes. North Korean South Korean yeah, border. Yeah, people forget that. Yeah. So if anyone drops a bomb in North Korea... No, no, North Korea could yeah. be there in an afternoon. Mm, precisely. Yes. Um, and what will happen is with a little war, North Korea will no doubt shell South Korea uh, with artillery and bomb them. Also, if any bomb, any nuclear bomb is dropped in North Korea, South Korea goes up in flames. Part of, parts of China and Russia bordering North Korea also go up in flames. <laughs> I mean, to put it like that, you'd think that can't possibly happen. But Trump is proving that anything mm. is possible, isn't he? Absolutely. And it's not just in North Korea where the problems are occurring. No. We've seen um, escalations in Syria, um, Ukraine. I mean, admittedly, this all started under Obama. Um, but I think the US is it's losing its power, and it's desperately trying to hold on. It's desperately trying to hold on to power and behaving more and more irrationally and more radically. But Trump did on. make the point that he was not going into these foreign mm. adventures mm. like his predecessors. That's true. He has actually held back and he's um, been quite reluctant to arm, uh, to give uh, offensive weapons to the Ukrainian government. He's also mentioned recently that he's going to pull back on arming the, um, the moderate or slightly less, slightly less moderate nicest terrorists uh, in Syria. However, the problem is um, Trump is himself, he has his hands tied by the deep state. The, the media, the intelligence organizations, the power of the, um, of the, uh, of the Congress and Senate, they are pushing him to war. If you think, for example, when, when we had that, um, when Trump a few months ago when he bombed the, uh, an airbase uh, in, in Syria, Syria yeah. after the alleged um, attack, chemical attack on, Shai, on uh, Shai, uh, Khan Sheikhoun. There was no evidence, of course, for that, but nevertheless, Trump um, ordered a, a tomahawk strike against... Uh, Over dinner with the mm. Chinese president. Yeah. He, he um, even told us what he was eating when he, gave the, when he pressed the button. That's right, and he referred to it as after-dinner entertainment. Yes. Though several people lost their lives, civilians mm. and Syrian mm. soldiers alike. Um, but, of course, it's interesting because after he did that, he went, he went up in the esteem of the Democrats, he went up in the esteem of the Liberals, the very Liberals who were criticising him for homophobia, misogyny, exactly. um, all the like. Suddenly they thought, hey, this is a good guy. He's doing exactly what Clinton would have done, what Obama did. So it's well, almost the, Obama's the, country. But well, this dichotomy is hmm. mystifying. Uh, the deep state is busily devouring him. Hmm. They are little, like piranha fish, devouring him. And yet he continues to do the things that they want him to do, presumably in the forlorn hope that they'll stop eating him. But he's already too, too far eaten, it seems to me. Why doesn't he do something different instead? I mean, he could do, but I think he's trying to swing both ways. He's trying to... Um, if, he did something, if he did something different unilaterally, for example, said, I'm making peace with Russia, um, or I'm going to develop better relations with Russia, I'm not going to arm um, terrorists in, in, in Syria, I'm not going to support the Ukrainian um, regime, he'd find himself impeached a lot faster. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Uh, uh, now, let's talk about the Ukraine, and then I want to ask you about sanctions. The, the coup government mm. in Ukraine, they are John McCain and the present, uh, uh, the, uh, the administration before this of President Obama's friends. Um, you're right, Trump is less willing, it would appear, to fight Russia on the Ukrainian front. But nonetheless, armed conflict still continues there. And it is one of the great flashpoints in the world at this time. Mm. There's a frozen conflict in Donbass. The problem is Poroshenko, the, the president, um, he's in a difficult position because the far right, uh, the fascists who uh, helped him get to power, they're pushing him for war and total, they, they want the total obliteration, genocide of people in Donbass. However, Poroshenko knows that the Ukrainian army is far too weak to defeat the, um, the rebels, who are now much better armed. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of the, the, the armed forces of Russia got a lot of the weapons from Ukraine, um, because the Ukrainian soldiers, when they fled the battlefield, they left a lot of the weapons behind. Um, those weapons, in turn, came from NATO. <laughs> so the, the rebels in East Ukraine are actually armed now by NATO weapons. They now have NATO weapons to fight back, so they can actually uh, give the Ukrainian army quite a bloody nose. And, actually, and Poroshenko knows if they invade again, it might be not only the end of the UAF, but the end of Ukraine, West Ukraine. Well. That's uh, an interesting point. Um, is Ukraine as a single state viable in the long term, or are these uh, regions that have more or less declared themselves as independent countries, is that problem going to grow? Can the Ukraine be reunited? Should it be reunited? And possibly, if it's reunited, it might be the, the, the reuniting might occur with other regions joining the, the Russia, um, mm. because at the moment Ukraine's economy is in tatters. Um, the civil rights are clearly gone out the window. You can be, there's posters up in Ukraine saying you can be arrested and put in prison for being, quote, separatist. 
Mm -hmm. And as opposed to saying call, um, giving phone numbers, saying call this number if you are, if you see a separatist. If you or, know a separatist. Yeah, if you know a separatist. Yeah. A separatist is someone basically who's against the regime. Mm. So of course we, the media, will, the Western media, will tell us a lot about Russia's so-called um, human rights abuses. But I've not seen a single report um, recently, at least, um, where saying that you can get being put in prison for several years for yeah. criticizing the regime in Kiev. No, of course uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to have a war, quarantine. Economic mm. sanctions are themselves a kind of war. Uh, there's no loss of appetite on the part of Trump's U.S. Uh, for continuing to sanction Russia, even though it's damaging to the European countries and particularly damaging to Germany, mm. which has a crucial uh, parliamentary election coming up. What can you tell us about the state of the sanctions war? Well, it's true enough, actually. Um, the sanctions have affected, as you mentioned, George, they've affected um, the EU countries much more than they have Russia. America's not really affected because it's, um, it's too, far, too far away, so America doesn't care so much about the sanctions. Russia, actually, um, since the sanctions were put in place a few years ago, uh, they've actually relied more on domestic uh, produce, so actually the Russian farmers have benefited. Mm. Um, in fact, Russia's actually switched more to domestic production, and also it's made stronger um, economic, um, t it's made stronger economic ties with countries to the east of Russia, like China. The EU has lost billions, however. Germany, in particular, has lost billions. That's why there's a number of German politicians and Italian politicians who are anti-sanctions and desperately campaigning and lobbying the EU Parliament to cut the sanctions. That if you look at the Nord Stream pipeline, for example, um, uh, America's actually said that they're going to punish any uh, EU companies that collaborate with Russia on building that pipeline. Um, so... Essentially, it shows how quickly America will throw its allies, so-called allies, under a bus. Well, this is a dagger <laughs> at the heart of German uh, capital in particular. And indeed, since the uh, end of the Second World War, for obvious reasons, and more so since the reunification of Germany, it's a kind of no-brainer that Germany can only benefit from good relations mm -hmm. with Russia. Mm -hmm. And the US are determined to spoil that, and it's amazing that Merkel has gone along with it as far as she has. But in the run-up to the elections, that could begin to be a real election issue, couldn't it? It could be. She might not win another term. I think um, it depends also it depends on a couple of things. One thing is, do the leaders of Germany and the other EU nations, do they love their people more than they hate Russia? Or are they willing to go along with these sanctions at the detriment of their people, their own businesses? Yeah. If they do, their economies will collapse. If they do America's bidding, their economies will collapse. And Britain, for example, may, I mean, depending whether or not they manage to push it through or not, or if they find a way around it, Britain may well have its Brexit in 2019. So Britain itself is going to need some more, need to make new friends, new trading partners. So it's well, not... If Britain had any sense, yeah. it would be making it's better relations with Russia. With Russia. Russia. Mm. It needs because uh, Britain's going to have to look for its own mm. arrangements, its own deals Precisely. with uh, countries like Russia and uh, others. Look, it's been marvellous having you back, and the fact that you've hardly been to bed after a long <laughs> shift as a junior doctor makes your performance all the more creditable. Thanks very much, Thank Dr. Tomas, for coming on the Sputnik. <laughs> and now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, we had a good debate going on on the question whether Macron and his centrist party is actually the model for Europe's future. Stephen Robertson says, I will be surprised if Macron is still in power Christmas 2017, never mind post-Brexit. Chewbacca says, no thanks, we had this kind of nonsense 20 years ago when Blair came into being. France ought to catch up, otherwise they will regret it. But we also have Hugh Appenzeller saying he has a uniting and healing power to refocus on our core European values after World War II, and we should all be proud of that. Well, I'm not sure what our core European values <laughs> after you World know, War II you know, uh, <laughs> were, but one shouldn't underestimate Macron uh, any more than it was correct to underestimate Tony Blair. Blair. The reason we're still talking about Tony mm. Blair is because he was really very good at it, and he won three elections, albeit uh, losing a few million votes along the way, <laughs> and if you managed to extract from your mind the disaster of Iraq and so on, you could say that for a while he was a very successful act. And so... The, the focus on act, yes. It was an act. Mm -hmm. That's a very key mm -hmm. point. And Macron is to an act. Uh, but an act can go for quite some time. That's right. In the absence of a credible alternative act 
or alternative force. And that's but what we France... are quite surprised, actually. But was... I'm very surprised. I'm surprised at the collapse of the NF. I'm surprised at the collapse of Mélenchon, yeah, the left, who, the proper in left. a way, came within an ace of being the president of France. And uh, then his, uh, his parliamentary election performance was so poor. It's left Macron in quite a strong position. Uh, but, of course, he stands for nothing, like Blair stood for nothing. And ultimately, that's got to get found out. So he'll definitely still be there at Christmas 2017. In fact, he'll definitely serve out his whole term. But I predict a lot of trouble on the streets of France over this winter With time. With cows and stuff in supermarkets. Well, they, they do it in a way that <laughs> no, no one else, else can. can do it. That's right. Well, that's all the time we've got for the tweets today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today, or Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs>